first time visitors today. Amen. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Welcome again. And to all of you, we pray that you have felt warm and welcome in the Friendship Baptist Church today, the ship, the greatest church in America. And we ask that if you uh, have a church home, you would go back and tell your pastor that you did worship uh, in the house of the Lord on this day. Ship, let's give them one great big welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Amen. Would you get out your seat? Find three people and tell them God loves you and so do I. Amen. been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we do now in the presence of God angels and this assembly most joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ we pledge therefore by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and to give it a place in our affections, prayers, and services above every organization of human origin, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel to all nations. We also pledge to maintain family and private devotion, to provide Bible and Christian instructions to our children, to seek the salvation of our relatives, friends, and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our behavior, to avoid gossip, unkind remarks, and excessive anger, to abstain from the sale and use of illegal substances, and to be faithful in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further pledge to watch over one another in Christian love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feelings, courtesy and speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready to reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior as recorded in the 18th chapter of Matthew, secured without delay. We also pledge that if and when we move from this community, we'll as soon as possible unite with some other churches where we can carry out the spirit of the covenant and the principles of God's word. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Our Old Testament scripture will come from the 27th number of Psalms, mm -hmm. verses 1 through 10. The 27th number of Psalms, verses 1 through 10. I will be reading from the Christian Standard Version of the Bible, so the translation may read just a little differently. And you will find these words recorded. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, when the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart should now fear. Though war may rise against me, in this will I be confident. Yes. One thing, 
one very thing that I have desired of the Lord that I will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his holy temple. For in the time of trouble, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me and he shall set me upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away from my anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. O God of my salvation, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord, then the Lord, then the Lord will take care of me. God's word for God's people. Good morning, friendship. I will be reading from the gospel according to John, chapter 6, verse 53 through 58. From the King James Version. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat my, f- eat the f- except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, yeah, yeah. and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well. He who eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drinking deed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. God's word for God's people. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Let us pray, our Father, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh God, we are so grateful today just to be in the land of the living. We didn't have to wake up this morning, oh God, but you had an angel who watched over us all night long and touched us with a finger of love. We pray right now, oh God, for this service. Yes. This communion service. Yes. We pray for our pastor right now, oh God. Yes. Lord, you say, at the steps of a good man, or oh, the better Lord, oh, yeah. though he fall, it should not be exceedingly. Cash Town. Pray for Pastor B. Pray for all our good looking clergymen this morning. Pray for all of them in the mighty name of Jesus. Pray for the Gerald family, Sister Rice. You know, one song where I say, I'm too close to my journey in. I'm too close to turn around in the world of sin. I'll take nothing for my journey now. Why, 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 why? I gotta make it to heaven somehow. Oh, glory be to God. Thank 
you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, oh God. Uh, let the Spirit, let your Holy Spirit permeate this service today. Have your way, Lord. Yeah. There may be somebody in our midst that don't know you. We ask you in the name of Jesus, touch their hearts right now. Bring them close to you. Lord, this is our humbly prayer. We ask in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen.
I want to invite your intellect and summon your senses to the gospel as recorded by Luke. <clears throat> Luke's gospel, it shouldn't be too hard to find. It is the third book in the New Testament. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and it is there and that the Holy Spirit is highlighted for us. Context of scripture, beginning with verse 17. Luke 22 and 17. <clears throat> Thank you. Would you confirm with me that you have it by the standing on your feet? Luke 22 and 17, and your Bible should read, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Amen. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 20 says, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Would you look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh, neighbor, I know it was the blood. Get somebody else and say, friendship neighbor, I know it was the blood. You may be seated in God's presence. The three synoptic Gospels and the book of First Corinthians include the account of the institution of the Lord's Supper in which Jesus takes the bread, breaks it, gives it to his disciples and says, this is my body given to you. The Gospel of John does not include this episode, but tells of Jesus washing the feet of the apostles, Amen. giving this new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. All right, all right. Uh -huh. Ladies and gentlemen, when we arrive at the scene of the Lord's Supper in Luke's Gospel in particular, you and I cannot understand Jesus with full clarity and comprehension unless we understand, if not meticulously, then at least generally, the role of Jesus as the fulfillment of the work of the high priest. All right, all right, all right. Can I take you to class today? If we don't see Jesus fulfilling the role of the high priest, then you and I miss the significance of the atonement Amen. or the payment of the penalty for sin by Jesus on the cross. <laughs> because according to the law of Moses, particularly in Exodus and through Leviticus, ladies and gentlemen, only the high priest could offer the sacrifice for the sins of the people one time a year on what was called the Day of Atonement. Amen, amen. On that day, the high priest, who must be from the tribe of Levi uh -huh. or a Levite, would enter the, most, the foremost room of the tabernacle, which was called the Holy of Holies, which was separated from the inner court by a veil, which housed the Ark of the Covenant, which was deemed to be the very presence of God, where only the high priest could go. Uh -huh. 
The priest would tie a rope around the waist of the high priest because if something happened to him in the Holy of Holies, because they could not go in, they would be prepared to drag him back out and not break the law of entry. At the atonement, the high priest carried on him the burden of the people, which was the guilt of sin, in which he took before God, not for permanent removal of the debt, but for a grace period until the next year. So now, ladies and gentlemen, the question is, how do we look at this atonement process of the high priest in light of Jesus on the cross? Most crucifixions did not occur in the way that Jesus' crucifixion occurred. The crucifixion of Jesus was exclusive and unique to the practice of torture. Most who were crucified were tied and not nailed to a cross. They were not beaten. They were not made to wear a crown of thorns. They were not pierced in the side, but their legs were broken. Nothing about a normal crucifixion was intrusive or even invasive, but centered around a slow suffocation as the person eventually collapses under their own body weight. The legs were broken when the victim took too long to die as to put more body weight pressure on the torso and increase the suffocation. So the question I ask is, brother preachers, why was the crucifixion of Jesus so bloody when normally it was not intrusive or invasive? Why is there so much blood with the crucifixion of Jesus? Can I take you to class? I'm going to teach till I feel like it. At the Passover meal or the Lord's Supper, Jesus ended the presentation of the supper by saying, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the remission of sins, which means that not just the death But the shedding of blood is critical and crucial for the atonement of sins. The shedding of blood was not the Romans' idea, but it was God's idea. The Romans' idea was death by suffocation. God demanded death by hemorrhage. Jesus is going to be crucified that next day, which was Friday. But his blood must be shed or poured out for the atonement before his death. Ladies and gentlemen, scholars have somewhat pinpointed the massive loss of blood between the beating and the piercing of his side to one gallon, four pints, or just under two liters of blood. Which means that in a span of about six hours, Jesus lost almost all of his blood. The reason why he could not carry his cross up the Via del Rosa, which is the road from Jerusalem Square to Calvary, and needed some help from Simon of Cyrene is because he had lost so much blood during the beating and the torture, and he is now severely dehydrated. If there's so much blood associated with the crucifixion, then there has to be, ladies and gentlemen, a major significance as to the purpose of this blood. Could it be that the loss of blood was as significant as the death itself? Could there have been his death without the massive loss of blood? Let's go to the text. The question remains as our thesis question, why is there so much blood? First of all, let's attack this and investigate it historically. When we go back and look at the beginning, 
The first sin that was committed after the sin of Adam and Eve was the spilling of blood by their son Cain. Amen. Genesis chapter 4 records that when God did not accept the sacrificial offering of Cain, but accepted his brother Abel's offering, that Cain rose up and killed Abel. Yeah. This is the first time that blood appears outside of the body. Abel's shed blood then brought in death from life. The blood that cried out to God from the ground cried out for the first time death. But Jesus' blood brought in life from death. We have been conditioned to think that Cain killed Abel, brother preachers, because he was angry that God accepted Abel's offering and not his. And it is true, God was not pleased with Cain's offering. But Cain, in an attempt to please God, does not offer another sacrifice of crops from his field. He tries to impress or please God by sacrificing to God what is closest to him, which is his brother Abel. Come here. We have conclusive evidence of this because Cain killed Abel in the field. Abel's offering came from animals. Cain's offering came from the field. And so he kills him, ladies and gentlemen, in the field. And God tells Cain, why are you angry? If you do well, you will be accepted. So Cain has seen that Abel has given the firstborn lamb, Lord have mercy, as an offering that is acceptable to the Lord. So somewhere, ladies and gentlemen, in Genesis, though it's not written in particular, God must have prescribed the only acceptable offering to him was a firstborn lamb. Y'all all right? God has always been pleased with the firstborn lamb. And so Cain must have thought that the sacrifice of his brother then must be a better sacrifice than the sacrifice his brother gave, which was the firstborn lamb. So to Cain, it was not just a murder out of anger. It was an attempted sacrifice of his brother out of envy. Yeah, yeah. He knew he was in trouble when God said, where is Abel your brother? Cain says back to God, am I my brother's keeper? When he said that since he had sacrificed his brother to God, then it meant that God was keeping the body of Abel. So he literally means by saying, am I my brother's keeper? He's literally telling God, God, you should know. So this means to Cain that God did not accept the sacrifice. And then God says, the blood of your brother cries out from the ground. Cain is now the third one to be cursed. Genesis chapter 3 and 14. Y'all stay with me this morning. I'm taking you somewhere. The serpent or Satan was cursed because he deceived Eve and caused Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. Genesis chapter 3 and 17. Because Adam heeded the voice of Eve over the command of God and ate the fruit, the ground is now cursed. It says, in toil you shall eat of it, both thorns and thistles. It shall produce for you and you shall eat from the sweat of your brow. Now in Genesis chapter 4 and 11, God tells Cain, you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. God could not curse the ground because it's already cursed. He could not curse Satan who was behind it all because he's already cursed. The only one left to curse was man. And the curse was because the blood that was intended by God to give life was instead spilled by Cain to produce death. Let's move from the historical to the theological. God now, ladies and gentlemen, has to deal with death, which has now become the result of this horrible curse. That's why Romans chapter 6 and 23 says that the wages of sin is death. The payment of sin is death. Sin demands the payment of death. 
death came in by sin, now sin will only be resolved by the payment of death. I'll try it like this. Someone died because sin came in. Now someone is going to have to die for sin to go away. 1 Corinthians 15 and 21 says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. The first Adam came from dust and returned to dust. The second Adam, Jesus, came from heaven and returned to heaven. The first Adam brought in death by disobedience. The second Adam Adam brought life by obedience. The first Adam was perfect with the ability to sin. The second Adam was perfect with the ability not to sin. The first Adam was made in God's image. The second Adam was the very image of God. The first Adam was a living soul. The second Adam was the living God. But God now has a dilemma. But I showed up to tell you at Friendship, he He's got a dilemma, but how many of you know that God's hands are never tied? Amen. The dilemma he faces now, come here class, is how does he reverse death or reverse the curse that man brought in by the killing of another man? The only way, ladies and gentlemen, to reverse the curse is to take the same blood that brought death from life and in reversal create a reset and bring life out of death. So now what compounds this dilemma of this reversal of death is that God has to have some necessary prerequisites. Here's what God needs. Tell your neighbor, here's what he needs. God needs human blood. God needs sinless blood. God needs blood that's able to return to life after it has died. Otherwise, man will remain under the curse of Cain. So the question is, in this dilemma, where does God find sinless human blood? Since now, after the sin of Adam, all mankind is born into sin. That's what we forget up in here, up in here, up in here sometimes. We get so holy and sedity and bougie and love to talk about other people's sin. We forgot that all of us have been born in sin. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how many clothes are in your closet. I don't care how many baths you take throughout the day. We are all filthy and dirty because of sin. You might as well quit looking at me that and tell your neighbor I sin too. No sinless blood exists on the earth, but God needs some human sinless blood. We know it because Psalm 51 and 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother did conceive me. It is the curse of Cain. And we know it because David said, I was brought forth in iniquity. Iniquity is not a transgression. A transgression is a trespass against God. That means God told you to do not to do something and you went ahead and did it anyway. That's a trespass. But an iniquity is a willful sin against another person. It is intentional hurt. It is intentional damage. It is even intentional death. It is assault, battery, and premeditated murder. So where is God going to find sinless human blood. If God can find such a person, he must be human and sinless. And then, ladies and gentlemen, to further compound the problem, not only must he be human and sinless, he must be willing to die. Because the Bible says that God detests human sacrifice. With God, he sent his son, but the son had to choose to die. But first to prepare us for the son. Catch this, during a span of 1,506 years between the law and the crucifixion, God put a system together. 
to atone or to make up for the blood that Cain spilled temporarily. We call it the sacrificial system. On the annual day of atonement, there it is, the high priest would call the blood at the altar or the sprinkling of blood which came from certain sacrificing animals. He would call that the covering of the blood. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest went through an elaborate period of purification and preparation resulting in the covering of blood. And whenever God saw the covering of blood, the high priest would be soaked in blood and God would look away from their sins temporarily until the same time next year. He could not look away permanently because you cannot redeem human blood with the lesser value of animal blood. Here's why, class. When God created Adam, he gave him dominion over the animals and the beast of the field. So if animal blood can redeem human blood, man never had dominion over animals. So using animal blood in the place of human blood was a slap in the face to man who would be embarrassed constantly that the thing that which he has dominion over now has dominion over his sin. So God could not temporarily accept the gesture of animal blood and use it as a reminder to man of the depravity of his sin. The second reason he could only temporarily accept it because under the law it was humans sacrificing animals. That means the animals had no say in it. So it was not a willing sacrifice. Lord, I'm working hard here, Reverend. It was a murder. Y'all say murder? murder? God could not redeem permanently a murder for a murder because all they were doing was replacing the murder of Abel with the murder of an animal. So the killing of an animal was a murder, but the death of Jesus had to be a willing sacrifice. When someone is murdered, they're not trying to die. They actually want to live. When one is sacrificed, they are willing to die. That's why Jesus says in John 10 and 17, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. The reason he says lay it down is because under the law, it was a struggle to get bulls and goats in this tabernacle to lay down at the altar to be sacrificed sacrifice. The bulls would buck and have to be restrained. The goats would kick against the goats in the ground and have to be drugged to the murder. He says, I lay it down myself. I'm not bucking. I'm not kicking. He had one moment in Gethsemane where he said, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. But when he came to himself as a divine son of man, he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. Ladies and gentlemen, he was not drugged from judgment hall to judgment hall. He willingly went. He was as a sheep led to the slaughter. And so at the cross, the last thing he said is, Father, into thy hands. Come here, class. I commend my spirit. The soldiers didn't kill him. Y'all missed that. Tell your neighbor, they didn't kill Jesus. They crucified him, but they didn't kill him. Because if they did, it would not be a sacrifice. It would have been a murder. And I already told you, God cannot redeem a murder for a murder. It has to be a willing sacrifice. And if they could kill him, then that would be humanity having dominion over divinity. And man could actually kill God. But because he gave it up, it was a willing Aren't you glad Jesus was willing? I need some people here who not afraid to wave a hand and admit you were filthy, you were dirty, you were raggedy, jacked up from the floor up, you were headed to hell in a hand basket. But when you think about Calvary, aren't you glad that while we were yet sinners, he was willing to die for us. Greater love hath no man.
man than to lay down his life for his friends. Come here. Now we begin to understand why the suffering was so bloody, but can I take you further? <laughs> Jesus became the high priest, and as this perfect sacrifice had to be covered in his own blood, the high priest was covered in lamb's blood. Jesus was covered in his own blood, which made him the sacrificial lamb. Isaiah chapter 53, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his sharers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. John chapter 1 and 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation chapter 5 and 12, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. Revelation chapter 12 and they overcome because of the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Revelation 13 and 8. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 21 and 27. At the white throat judgment he opens up his book and do you know what his book is called? It's called the lambs. Book of life. Tell somebody he's a lamb. The prescription for the lamb being sacrificed on the day of atonement is that the lamb they chose, catch this, it had to be a Paschal lamb. <laughs> Come here, class. I'm going to learn you today. It had to be a Paschal lamb. That word Paschal means perfect. It had to be a lamb without spot or blemish or mark or defect, which they considered perfect. God would not accept the blood of a defective lamb for atonement. The Bible says that Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He had no defect. He lived with no sin. He needed no repentance. He required no forgiveness. If he was not covered in his own blood, he could not make atonement because he would not have been purified for us. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's investigate it geographically. 1,506 years later, God got something, y'all. God has human blood. Preaching here, Pastor Elect. God has sinless human blood. God has sinless human blood that's capable of coming back to life after death. And he has sinless human blood that's capable of coming back to life after death that's willing to die. Amen. But to complete this atonement, the one last thing he needs is not on Calvary's hill. I'm trying just to teach today, but y'all making it hard. He needs one more thing, Reverend, and it's not on Calvary's hill. It's in the temple. If Jesus is going to fulfill the role of the high priest, God needs a veil for him to go behind and make atonement where the people can't come or see. Now, God can't take Jesus off the cross and put him in the temple because Jesus had to stay up on the cross. And so it says that darkness came over the geography of the land for three hours. Notice Jesus doesn't say it is finished until after the darkness. For three hours in the middle of the afternoon, God made the earth a veil. He didn't need the temple because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And Jesus was beyond the veil of darkness, making atonement with the Father. And nobody saw it because only the high priest could go beyond the veil. During those three hours, the old preachers used to say that the sun refused to shine 
But can I tell you what happened geographically? There are three cataclysmic events. All right. Come on, come on. <laughs> that upset the geographical vicinity of Calvary. The first cataclysmic event was geologically. Yeah. The earth quaked. Yeah. The rocks split. Yeah. This isn't the first time in the region of Palestine that they had an earthquake, but it was the first and only time that the earth quaked at the same time that the sun quit. Yeah. The second cataclysmic event was not only geologically, it was anthropomorphically. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the tombs were open. Yeah. Yeah. And the dead, dry bones of the saints became living, breathing witnesses and marched throughout the city, yeah. praising God. The third cataclysmic event was not only geographically and anthropomorphically, it was meteorologically. Yeah. That's pretty good for an old man this time of day. For three hours, the sun darkened, and the full moon of the Passover suggests that it could not be attributed to the science of a solar eclipse. Supernaturally, y'all say supernaturally. For three hours, God turned off the light while his son suffered on the cross. Aren't you glad that God still does that? Because the Bible says who God loves, he chastens. And thank God that sometimes God whoops us, but he turns off the light so can't nobody see what's going on between you and God. Am I preaching to anybody who can testify that I was punished and whooped by God, but he covered it from everybody else seeing what he was dealing with me with? I'm almost there. We know that Jesus was beyond the veil of darkness because three hours was the time the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. And Leviticus chapter 16 says, which sprinkled the blood on the altar. And when he says it is finished, there's one final cataclysmic event. The veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. You have to understand through Jewish eyes <clears throat> that the ripping of the veil meant to them, give me some water, meant to them that God was done with them. But what it really meant was God didn't need the veil anymore. Top to bottom was a sign that it was ripped by God himself because no man could rip the veil. When the veil was ripped by God from top to bottom, God is saying, I don't need a high priest anymore. Let these people come directly to me. I don't need a representative to come on their behalf. When they get ready to pray, they can pray to me. When they get ready to talk, forget the veil. They can come on and talk to me. Is there anybody here that can testify? When I needed Jesus, I didn't have time to call the pastor. I couldn't get a hold of Reverend Burns. There wasn't no deacon available. But what I found out is I can cast my cares upon him because he cares for me. And is there anybody here that can testify Jesus is on the main line? I can call him and get him what I want him. No man could rip the veil. The temple veil, according to early Jewish tradition, was as wide as the thickness of the palm of the hand, which is about five to six inches. The veil, ladies and gentlemen, was so heavy that it needed 300 priests to move it. The fabric was so strong, it took 82 women sewing daily for one year just to make a whole new veil. Before the veil was hung, they tested the strength of the veil by pulling horses tied to the veil in opposite direction and if they could not rip the veil the veil was worthy to be hung in the temple but tell your neighbor God ripped it the first sign of the ripping of the veil there's no human being that could have ripped it the Lord did it the real high priest had come and went beyond the veil for the last time the next thing that happens come here I'm almost through is they pierce Jesus in the side 
Y'all all right, I need five minutes. I'm lying, I probably need 10. Take time. The soldiers thought they were doing it to confirm his death. But the most blood came out when they pierced him in his side. Notice they broke the legs of the thieves because the Sabbath day was coming and they needed them to hurry up and die. But they stabbed Jesus, Lord have mercy, in the side. Why was the sacrifice pierced in his side? Ladies and gentlemen, when they pierced him in his side, that's when he became the second Adam. Because he redid what Adam undid. Y'all ain't feeling me. When God gave Adam a bride, he took Eve out of Adam's rib. And when Eve came out of Adam's side, she became the bride and Adam became the bridegroom. When the blood came out of Jesus' side, he became the bridegroom and the church became the bride. And so Adam said about Eve, she is now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Therefore he says that two have become one flesh because Eve was connected to Adam by the blood. When his blood was shed on the cross, he connected you and I to his body. Now we are the body of Christ. Through the blood, tell your neighbor, I know it was the blood. Now because we are married to Christ, there is nothing that can cause a divorce. Paul says that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of y'all gonna make me feel preaching from the love of God through Christ Jesus and because we are married to Christ he is not satisfied with a long distance relationship he doesn't want Marvin Gaye's distant lover he doesn't want Stevie Wonder's part-time lover he doesn't want Snow Allegra's situationship he misses his bride he wants his bride he just doesn't want to be with his bride on Sunday he wants to be with his bride every day he wants to shower his bride with love and blessing. He wants to talk with his bride and walk with his bride and tell his bride that we are his own. He wants to provide for his bride and protect his bride. And one day soon, he's coming back, not for the marriage, but Revelation 19 and seven says he's coming back for the marriage feast. Yeah, 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 yeah. The feast takes place after the marriage. The marriage took place on the cross. I'm through here. And if it wasn't for the blood, we would have been jilted on the cross. We would have been stood up on the cross. We would have been abandoned on the cross. We would have been deserted at the cross. We would have been waiting at the altar, but the groom never shows up. But thank God for the blood of Jesus. Would you just make me feel like it? Would you high five your neighbor and say, thank God for the blood of Jesus. I'll give you the short version and I'm going to my seat. In Luke chapter 22, I said all that to say this. When we get to the upper room, ladies and gentlemen, they are reclining at the table. And the Passover meal is about to be served. On the table are bowls of broth made from lamb's drippings. But you will notice in the synoptic accounts that there is no mention of the meat of the lamb on the table. Look at your name and say, come here. He had the bread, he had the wine to symbolize his death, but there's no lamb on the table because he didn't need the lamb because he had become the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And there are plates of unleavened bread, four cups of wine at any other Passover. They would eat the meat and the bread dipped in broth. At the end of the meal, they would drink from the cup, symbolizing Israel's deliverance from Egypt. They're at the table, waiting for the lamb to come and be served. That's why they are reclining. But the lamb was already there waiting 
to be led as sheep unto the slaughter. As a complete shock to the 12, he begins the meal without a lamb. Here's what he does. He took the bread. I thought I was in a Baptist church. Blessed it and break it. And said, this is my body given for you. He skips over two cups, takes the third cup, which is the Passover cup of blessing. This is the cup that was full because it memorialized the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. He says, this is my blood shed for the you for the remission of sin. Jesus took the Passover and by his blood, catch this, he made the Passover turn into a pass through. In just three days, after his blood was poured out on the cross, Jesus would pass through death. In Exodus, death passed over. On Calvary, Jesus passed through death. He made what was permanent temporary and what was final just a transition. That's why I'm not scared to die anymore. That's why I don't fear death. I'm not given the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. I'm not trying to avoid death. I just want to live a good quality of life while I'm alive. But one of these old days, when I do die, because death passed through, it won't be final. It will only be a transition. Y'all ain't feeling me. Absent from the body. Somebody shout, he got up. Cain put a period on death. Jesus changed the period into a comma. Jesus died until death died. Before Jesus, the blood caused death to pass over. But now because of the blood, we pass through death. That's good news for somebody facing something right now in your life. It didn't pass over you, but you are about to pass through it. Would you help me encourage somebody who may be going through something today? Tell them, neighbor, you about to pass through it. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he got up, I can get up. And if it wasn't for the blood, you wouldn't make it through. If it wasn't for the blood, I'd be on my way to hell in a handbasket. Can I tell you what the blood does? It reaches the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, I got a Baptist church through here. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never, it will never lose its power. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Can I give you my testimony? Because I done got happy. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Is there anybody here that can give him praise that his blood was shed? Anybody here can say thank you that he picked you up? Come on, just turn around and you see. Turn you around, set your feet on a solid ground. High five your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know it was the blood. It wasn't Muhammad, it wasn't Buddha, it wasn't Confucius. I know it was the blood that shed for me. And because of that, I'm saved and I'm glad about it.
you. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you don't know my story. I need the blood of Jesus. And when I get in trouble, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over my house, over my children, over my body, over my finances, over my church. now give your tithes and offerings electronically through a link on the internet, a text to give number, or through a mobile app called Give Plus. Now for those who are comfortable giving in the old school way of writing a check or money order, you can still do that by sending a check payable to Friendship Baptist Church at the address listed on screen. But for those who would like to use a safe mobile app a secure web link, or to easily send a text to give your tithes and offerings, this system is now available. For more information, please view the videos that follow or click the link below to send an offering online. In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give, and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. 
Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.